Welcome back to our Bible study as we're making our way through the book of John. I'm sure you are all like me, and this study so far has been impactful and encouraging as we've studied about our Savior King. When I have examined the demographics on YouTube, I've been humbled how God has used this study to reach out to many around the world. I'm thankful for all of you who participate in this ministry through prayer and faithful viewership. Many of you have contacted me over the years to let me know you're in a BSF class and you use this lecture to augment your BSF fourfold approach to studying God's word. But if there are some of you who are watching and you're not a BSF member, I would deeply encourage you to go to bsfinternational.org and sign up today. It's free to be a member, and BSF is very generous in giving out free materials to its members. So if you've been sitting on the sidelines waiting for the right time to join BSF, today is the day. Please go to bsfinternational.org and sign up today. All right, that's it for our announcements. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are perfect in goodness and righteousness. You're holy. You are set apart from your creation. No one is like you. Yet, you have called us to be holy, for you are holy. Help us to settle our hearts and minds as we focus on you and your word. In Christ's powerful name, amen. As we get going today, let me ask you a question. When have you started a new adventure? <clears throat> when have you started a new adventure? And how often do you have a plan B in case plan A doesn't work out? Often in human relationships, couples initially will leave some back doors so they have some options in case the current relationship doesn't work out. This backdoor strategy later on will cause serious problems in the relationship because it exposes a lack of pure devotion or commitment to the other person. For the last 500 years, a phrase has enter entered our world to express a strategy that emphasizes unwavering commitment by eliminating options for retreat. And that phrase is burn the ships. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. One of our leaders reminded us of it at our Friday morning meeting. But when someone says burn the ships, they are saying, I'm all in. Retreat and turning back is essentially impossible. The origin of the phrase comes from the Spanish conquistador Cortez when he and his man, men landed in Mexico in 1519, Cortez was concerned about the commitment of his men to stay the course. Cortez needed to eliminate any possibility of retreat and compelling his men to stay committed to the conquest. Well, our fallen nature tempts us to retreat from our devoted and committed relationship with Jesus. Because of our fallen nature as believers, we need to burn the ships so that we stay dedicated to the narrow path that God has placed us on and we don't wander away like sheep. Today, we will see Mary burn the ships as she breaks the alabaster jar of perfume. And we'll see Judas, who left a back door and was lured away by his love of money. So today... Our lesson is divided into three divisions. Our first division is John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, the king anointed. And our second division is verses 12 through 19, the king enters Jerusalem. And our last division is verses 20 through 50, the king predicts his death. As we get started in our first division, the king anointed, please turn to John chapter 12. Before we dive into the scripture, John in the previous 11 chapters focused on the seven signs or miracles as evidence that Jesus is the Son of God 
and through belief in him, you may have eternal life. Roughly three years of Jesus's earthly ministry was represented in those 11 chapters. But now John is slowing down his narrative as chapter 12 covers less than a week. And then he really puts the brakes on as chapters 13 through 20 cover three days. Chapter 12 also represents a shift in Jesus's ministry. Instead of conducting a widely public ministry, Jesus's ministry now shifts as he will spend his last week with his close friends and prepare his disciples for what was coming. In verse 1 and 2, John sets the scene that Passover is six days away, and Jesus is in Bethany with his disciples at the house of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And the group is honoring and celebrating Jesus with a meal. And Mary is going to do something outrageous and culturally shocking at the dinner party. Let's read about it in verse 3. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, why would this be shocking? First of all, in first century Judaism, women did not take their hair down in public. Second of all, in their culture, it was degrading to touch another person's feet, especially to wash their feet with your hair. In their day, the glory of a woman was her hair, and to use her hair as a wash rag would have been shocking. Also, the sheer financial cost of this act of worship would have been hard for others to understand. The perfume was part of her dowry, and to use it on Jesus might hinder her in her future marriage. But Mary didn't care about all these things. She was overcome with gratitude and devotion to Jesus. We're told that the aroma of her worship infused throughout the entire house and dinner party. We don't know if Mary understood the deeper actions of her worship, but Mary gave something that was precious to Jesus out of her appreciation for him and in the process served him by anointing him for burial. Now, as guys, we typically struggle with expressing public worship. We don't wave our arms or dance for joy or cry in public unless it deals with sports. In that case, we'll paint our faces, take our shirts off in freezing weather, dance around with our buddies as we cheer on our team to victory. Which brings up the question, why is it easier to get crazy and nutty when it comes to our sports teams, but we're so reserved and subdued when it comes to worshiping God? Well, often when people express extreme devotion to the Lord, it often gets misunderstood by the crowd. And Mary's worship to Jesus brought Judas Iscariot to a breaking point. Let's read what Judas said, starting in verse 5. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Well, John's editorial comment in verse 4 and verse 6 gives the reader the true insight into Judas's objection. We learn that Judas will eventually betray Jesus, and he was motivated by money. It's interesting that Mary's worship was worth a year's wage, and Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, which was worth approximately a month to a month and a half wages. Judas's price to betray the Messiah was much less than what Mary poured on Jesus' feet. Judas's love of money drove him to betray Jesus, where Mary's love for Jesus drove her to express her love through costly worship. It's interesting how human nature will hide bad motives by using valid sentiment like helping the poor. However, what Judas really wanted to do was pocket some of the money. This scene reveals Judas's unredeemed heart. 
He wanted to ride the wave of following the Messiah to see how far he could get and how it would and how it might profit him financially. Unfortunately, this type of profiteering didn't stop with Judas. We see in the book of Acts that Simon the sorcerer wanted to profit from Christianity. And in our culture today, there are those who disguise themselves as Christian leaders to fleece God, to fleece the flock. Now, in the coming weeks, we'll talk more about Judas. But before we move on, occasionally in our study this year, I've discussed the Gnostics and their strange theology. Because in John's day, the Gnostics were growing and perverting the gospel. Well, I'm sure some of you guys have heard of the book, The Gospel of Judas. Well, The Gospel of Judas is a Gnostic book. And instead of presenting Judas as an unredeemed thief who betrayed Jesus for money, it portrays Judas as an obedient disciple who was following Jesus's commands. Now, I know you guys have good discernment, would never be taken in by these Gnostic writings, but you might have friends or family members who have an unbiblical view of Judas as a good guy because they've read the gospel of Judas. Moving on in verse seven, Jesus rebukes Judas and defends Mary's worship and gives everyone insight into the deeper meaning behind the anointing of Jesus with the perfume. And as we look at verse nine, we see that the dinner party caught the eye of the religious leaders. So, so we can get a feel for the passage. Let's read in, let's read in verse nine. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For an account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. As we discussed last week, the raising of Lazarus was the last sign John used as evidence that Jesus was the Son of God. The evidence of raising a dead man caused many Jews to change their mind about Jesus and believe in him as the Messiah. It appears that Lazarus' testimony was so strong that he was also responsible for turning others to Jesus. And because of his testimony, the chief priest decided that he had enough. It wouldn't be good enough to only kill Jesus but they would also need to kill Lazarus. Which brings us to our first principle, which is God desires self-sacrificial worship. God desires self-sacrificial worship. Jesus in this earthly ministry had a lot to say how our worship and dedication to him would shape our priorities and outlook in this life. And just in case we didn't catch it, in reading the gospel accounts, the Apostle Paul clarifies it by saying the following in Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Mary's worship in this division embodied this type of worship. Mary expressed her love for Jesus through a giving heart. While Judas's example showed evidence of a darkened heart that wanted to take and profit from Jesus's ministry. So let me ask you, how does your worship of Jesus reveal your heart condition? How does your worship of Jesus reveal your heart condition? As we start our second division, the king enters Jerusalem. Please turn to verse 12. As we head deeper into the chapter, the scene shifts from the fragrant smelling dinner party in Bethany to a busy street leading into Jerusalem. Before we turn to scripture, back in our study of people of the promised land in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 33, we see King Solomon symbolically riding through the streets of Jerusalem on David's mule to show that he was the rightful successor to David's throne. With that in mind, let's start reading in verse 12. The next day, the great crowd <clears throat> that had come for the festival 
heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. At Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he wasn't on a majestic horse like a warrior king, but he was on a donkey as a gentle, humble king who brought peace, who was riding on a symbol of peace as well as the Davidic symbol of the rightful king of the Jews. Verse 13 says the people were shouting. What were they shouting? John lets his readers know they were shouting parts of Psalm 118, a messianic psalm written by David, where they were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. <clears throat> From their shouts, the excited crowd understood at some level, Jesus was the king of Israel who came in the name of the Lord. Moving on to verse 15, John records that the events were fulfilling a well-known messianic prophecy found in Zechariah 9.9. Let's read it. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. The events of the day <clears throat> wouldn't make sense to the disciples until after Jesus ascended to heaven and they received the Holy Spirit, which highlights the importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit when it comes to understanding scripture. The Pharisees, on the other hand, understood the meaning of the event all too well, and they were getting desperate. But let's read verse 19 to get a feel for their desperation. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. As we discussed last week, the Pharisees were fighting a losing battle. They wanted to arrest Jesus ahead of time before Passover week, but they weren't able to because of God's divine protection of Jesus. And now the people are turning away from them as the leaders and rulers and are turning to Jesus as their king. Which brings us to our second principle, which is Jesus will not be denied his kingdom. Jesus will not be denied his kingdom. Jesus did not enter Jerusalem on a great horse, a symbol of conquering generals and earthly kings. Instead, he came on the colt of a donkey, a symbol of servitude and humility. Yet Jesus conquered our great enemies, death, hell, and the, dev and the devil. In the future, Jesus will come back and he'll be riding on a white stallion and he will establish his earthly kingdom, and he will reign and rule over the nations. And like his entry into Jerusalem, in this week's lesson, <clears throat> when he comes back, the crowd will be similar to the crowd this week, <clears throat> where the crowd consisted of true followers and people who reject him as Savior and King. A believing heart, a soft heart, receives Jesus as the Savior King while a darkened heart, a hard heart, rejects Jesus as the Savior of the world. So let me ask you, what in your heart needs to be dethroned so Jesus will be in his rightful place in your heart? What in your heart needs to be dethroned so Jesus will be in his rightful place in your heart? As we start our third division, the king predicts his death. Please turn to verse 20. Before we examine the scripture, when Jesus was born, God-fearing Gentiles from the east journeyed to see the young king. Days before Jesus' death, God-fearing Greeks, let's say Gentiles, in verse 20, came from the west to see the king. They initially went to Philip, who took him to Andrew, who took him to Jesus. In verse 23, Jesus seems to ignore the Gentile visitors as he addresses the entire crowd gathered around him. However, based upon what Jesus says, potentially Jesus is telegraphing the dawning of a new age where he is drawing the Gentiles to him. But Jesus had come to the Jews with the gospel and the crucifixion and resurrection needed to be accomplished. Let's read what Jesus said to the crowd starting in verse 23. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. 
Once again, we see Jesus' teaching style in action, taking a simple task of planting seeds to explain the complex theological truth of the Lord's substitutionary death for sinners. Let's keep reading, starting at verse 25. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Jesus' statement, like other sayings earlier in his ministry, is a bit of a mind bender. Jesus isn't saying selfishness leads to loss of life, but selfishness is evidence that you are not living life as God intended. Nor is Jesus saying the primary purpose of unselfish behavior is to be rewarded, but instead, Jesus is saying unselfish behavior is evidence of living life as God intended. These <clears throat> verses lead us into the BSF doctrine this week, which is the cross for the believer. When Jesus died on the cross, his sacrifice brought eternal life to all who believe in him. A believer who follows Jesus, no matter the cost, deny, dies to self-interest and self-sufficiency. Jesus' call to discipleship is not easy. Obeying Jesus means following him on a path of self-denial. Taking up your cross represents a personal and willing determination to uphold God's priorities above our own. Jesus spoke of us hating our lives on earth in order to follow Christ, which means we renounce all plans that conflict with obeying the Lord. God blesses sacrificial obedience with spiritual fruitfulness and eternal impact on others. But what happens when someone rejects the idea of the need to pick up your cross and follow Jesus? They go through life with a limited perspective as they focus on this world and not eternity. They will place their desires, plans, and agenda above God's. They will not flourish as God intends or find the satisfaction their souls crave. Now, the dreadful hour had come, and Jesus expressed how troubled his soul was in a prayer to the Father. We knew that separation from the Father while experiencing the wrath of the Father was going to be far greater than the suffering from the hands of the Romans. But Jesus knew the Father's plan and will, and he was obedient unto death. Often, we remember the Father's voice at the baptism of Jesus and at the Mount of Transfiguration. But sometimes we forget the Father spoke from heaven during Jesus' last week in Jerusalem. The Father, at the request of Jesus to glorify his name, said the following. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. When this happened, Jesus said the following to the crowd. This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Soon at the cross, Satan and his worldly system will be delivered a death blow. Jesus' substitutionary death would be fatal to Satan. But obviously, evil still lingers in the world today. But Satan's demise is inevitable which we will learn about next year when we study the book of Revelation. But today, believers are no longer under the oppression of sin. No longer are we slaves to sin, but we can live our lives for Jesus, who frees us from the power of sin. And we say, Amen. In verse 34, the crowd asks a question. If Jesus is the Messiah, how can the Messiah die? Jesus responds to this question with an important warning that the crowd needed to hear. Let's read it in verse 36. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of the light. The crowd asked a question that would potentially lead to a theological debate, but Jesus saw through that, and instead, Jesus warned them that there is a finite amount of time 
in which each individual has the opportunity to respond to the light of the world. And after that comes darkness. With the reality that not all God's people believe, even with all the evidence and Jesus' strong call to believe in him, would lead John's reading audience to ask the question, why did most of the Jews reject Jesus? Well, this leads to a challenging theological topic, which is referred to as judicial hardening of the heart of the nation of Israel. John briefly covers it here in chapter 12, but the Apostle Paul covers it in more detail in the book of Romans, which BSF will be back in in a few years. The BSF notes cover this topic, so please refer to your notes, but let me say a few things. John uses two quotes from the prophet Isaiah to show that judicial hardening had a divine origin, which in Romans chapter 9, Paul reveals the purpose behind the hardening of the Jewish nation was to bring the Gentiles into God's family. And next year, when we're in the book of Revelation, we will see God replace the heart of stone, the hearts of stone, with, a, with, a, with soft hearts that will recognize Jesus as their long-awaited Messiah. But we should note that the judicial hardening didn't extend to all Jews because many did come to faith in Jesus, to include some of the Jewish leaders, as John points out in verse 42. But since most of us are Gentiles, I would say our concern is the hardening of the heart of the individual and not the judicial hardening of the nation of Israel. What do I mean by this? Let me ask this question. What happens to a person who rejects the truth of Jesus over and over again? Well, <clears throat> in chapter 1 of, in Romans, Paul points out that there is a point that God firms up their unbelief by giving them over to their sinful ways. There is a lot to this theological subject, but Romans 1 is a good starting point to understand it. Let's read part of it, starting in verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Our focus this year has been Jesus, our Savior King. Verses 47 through 50 represent his last public teaching. So let's finish out our study today by reading those verses. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Jesus came from the Father with a mission to reveal him to us and to provide a way of escape to him from sin, death, and hell. The cross was the focal point of his coming. Jesus glorified the Father through his obedience, even to the point of death. His obedience and glorifying the Father led to his exaltation to the Father. Paul explains that Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. Since the first fruits are a sign that the harvest has begun and many more crops are yet to come, Paul is saying that Jesus was the first to rise, which would lead to many more in the future to be resurrected. Which leads us to our third principle, which is self-sacrifice leads to a fruitful life in God's economy. Self-sacrifice leads to a fruitful life in God's economy. Love, is, love of self is deeply ingrained into our sinful nature. Putting God and others before ourselves is a battle that can only be won through God's strength. Our sinful nature doesn't give up the battleground easily. 
Dying to self involves a deep commitment to obey God in a moment by moment surrender to his will. So let me ask you, where is God asking you to die to self so that you may grow in service to him? Where is God asking you to die to self so that you may grow in service to him? As we wrap up today, the big idea for this chapter is Jesus calls his followers to die to themselves. This lesson highlighted the paradigm shift in John's narrative from describing the seven signs to describing acts of worship. Mary's worship modeled how our worship should be, an outpouring of complete devotion. This week, in your worship of Jesus, don't hold anything back. Burn the ships. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that we will be people who aren't distracted by the shiny things of this world, but we'll be able to keep the details and circumstances of our lives in proper perspective as we strive to keep our worship holy and pure. Allow us to continue to grow together as a band of brothers as we break into our small groups and discuss the lesson. In Christ's name, amen. Oh,